Right, uh, to begin with, um, the uh, infamous uh, Artemis launch that's been uh, cancelled uh, three times so far. The first two due to uh, liquid hydrogen uh, leaks and then uh, the third one due to um, threat of storm is, uh, is now uh, scheduled a fourth time. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a very friendly time in Australia on the 4th of November. It's after one o'clock in the morning that it's uh, scheduled to take off, so uh, there won't be too many people sitting up for that one. Given the chance of it being scrubbed uh, a fourth time, uh, are probably uh, not uh, minimal. Um, on the, uh, the top uh, right of the screen there, and uh, Mark uh, will say a little bit more about the lunar eclipse later, are the circumstances of the eclipse in Australia. Um, everything in that darker region there sees the entire e eclipse from beginning to end, from uh, the uh, penumbra in to the penumbra out. Where we are is the next uh, level down, so we're not quite seeing everything for the, uh, the lunar eclipse, but we're certainly better off than Western Australia. It doesn't uh, get to see uh, much at all. And the other thing that was mentioned last month was, um, and also I, I sent something around on uh, eScorpius as well to read, was the uh, Wallal Eclipse in Western Australia. And if you don't know where Wallal is, um, here's the uh, original map from um, uh, 1922, and it's uh, pretty close to uh, Broome, or relatively close as far as Australia goes. And this is where uh, um, Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity was uh, put to the test uh, during a uh, mid-eclipse. It's not the first time it was uh, tried. There was an earlier attempt by Eddington and, and so forth that um, had arguably um, a, a little bit of uh, rose-coloured uh, glasses in terms of uh, getting uh, outcomes from it. But the one in uh, Wallal uh, was conducted a lot more carefully and uh, was uh, conclusive. Um, it's, uh, the centenary of that was uh, in September and uh, Australia Post issued uh, special stamps and also coins and I'll send around a couple of the coins here to have a look at if you're interested. There's um, the usual sort of aluminium bronze type one and then there's the silver one which is actually um, a, a dome shape. And uh, why I mentioned those last month was because it had just been released and uh, there was only going to be a limited number of, uh, of them actually uh, coined. But uh, it was pretty remote, no roads into the area. They had to bring in everything by boat and it was something like 35 tonnes worth of gear had to uh, come in. And uh, you can see the sort of uh, instruments that they had to set up using uh, lumps of uh, lumber and, uh, and metal. And uh, it's all uh, pretty amazing that uh, they managed to uh, get uh, sort of conclusive results. So what they did was uh, they were looking for the position of the background stars behind the sun and as to whether or not they have moved when the sun is actually completely covered by the moon. So the moon comes across the sun in a solar eclipse um, and hence you're then able to see the background stars which ordinarily you can't see in the daytime because it's just simply too bright in the blue sky and by carefully measuring the position of the stars um, during mid-eclipse and comparing it to say six months prior to that um, of a night time when you can measure their position accurately you notice that they're not in exactly the position that you predict and that's because the, um, the gravitational field of the Sun has uh, distorted space-time and so consequently um, they appear to uh, be in a slightly different position and that was uh, shown uh, for the first time really conclusively in that 1922 one in uh, Australia. Now the other thing of note, and we covered this in quite a bit of detail last uh, meeting, uh, was uh, the DART impact on uh, Dimorphos and uh, its uh, parent asteroid uh, Didymus. Um, last meeting was uh, literally uh, a day or two before the uh, impact was due. And uh, you see in the, the top left here, uh, Dimorphos is in a um, uh, anti-clockwise orbit around Didymus and then the DART spacecraft from NASA's launch uh, came and hit it head on in its orbit. And by hitting it head on, it would slow the asteroid down slightly and cause its orbit to drop down to a slightly lower orbit, or at least that was uh, the theory. Um, the actual impact, some of you may have watched this uh, live, is shown on the top uh, right hand side of the screen. So that's the live uh, view from the camera on board uh, the DART uh, projectile, which was over 600 kilos. Um, so quite, uh, quite a bit of mass uh, coming in. Uh, 
and uh, it fills the frame uh, fairly quickly right up until the last uh, couple of instances and uh, we'll be there in just a couple of seconds from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University and then it stops uh, midstream as it smashes its camera to pieces on the surface of um, uh, dimorphous and over on the bottom left here is the view as seen from the ground in uh, uh, La Reunion the uh, island in uh, the Atlantic um, with uh, one of the European Space Agency's uh, telescopes uh, live and you can see at the moment of in impact uh, the debris coming off the front of the comet remember it's been hit head-on in its direction so the spacecraft is coming from the left at, uh, at that uh, orientation and uh, over to one side here is uh, this little uh, satellite's view. So that uh, Leisha satellite was uh, built by the uh, Italian Space Agency, ASI, and uh, it literally was only like 30 centimetres by 20 centimetres by 10 centimetres, so barely the size of a shoebox, or even less than that. And it was literally strapped to the side of the main spacecraft and released a couple of weeks before the anticipated uh, impact. And its uh, primary uh, purpose was to photograph the impact uh, uh, just behind. So as you see, it's uh, coming into the impact there. And then you'll see material coming off uh, as it uh, flicks by very, very quickly out the other side. And it's quite possible that um, this may go on to study uh, uh, other asteroids as well, if there's sufficient fuel for them to, uh, to work it out. And then down the bottom here is uh, the actual outcome of it. Did they change the orbit? Well, they were anticipating a 10-minute um, reduction in the orbital period of the Moon around um, uh, Didymos, and it actually ended up as 32 minutes. So what you see here is ground-based uh, instruments here showing um, eclipses occurring as they're watching the main asteroid, and every now and again the Moon comes in front of it and causes it to dim and that's when you see it duck down and they can predict where it uh, should have uh, dimmed if everything was A-OK -okay and no change had actually occurred and the change that they occurred, uh, the change that they saw was that the dimming uh, occurred a good 22 minutes uh, more than uh, the 10 minutes that they were anticipating. Now that may very well be that uh, this particular asteroid is a lot more solid than anticipated and so um, not so much of the energy of the spacecraft was uh, absorbed in like the crumple zone of uh, the rubble on the surface of uh, these uh, minor planets in this particular one. So all very exciting stuff. So tonight, welcome to everyone who's uh, new to these meetings. Um, do please feel free to say hello to uh, any of our members and um, if you're a new uh, new member, uh, you probably have already met uh, Nerida uh, sitting in the back row there. Um, do uh, make yourself uh, uh, known at uh, half uh, halfway through the evening. We'll uh, break for uh, coffee and uh, tea. I'll go through, as usual, the events of uh, the uh, the past month and the upcoming month. Then I'll show you some uh, a latest bit of uh, research output from uh, NASA and Durham University on the Thea Earth collision. This was published only a couple of weeks ago. And this will be the cross-sectional view of it. I'll show you that. Then on to the main feature, which is the uh, geology of uh, asteroids and uh, comets by an astrophysicist who has spent his life uh, actually studying them. Then uh, on to Sky for the month, and then some other uh, impact-related things uh, will be shown after the tea break. Can a moon have a moon? And turns out that we can't actually use nuclear weapons on asteroids, and you'll see, uh, see why uh, as you, you go through that. And lastly, uh, update on the Tunguska impact as well, and why they've never found any debris for that. There was a uh, paper published uh, about that. So recent events, uh, the last month uh, we've been uh, fairly busy. Um, there have been uh, at least one working bee up here and a couple of informal working bees uh, I know by, uh, by Phil as well. Um, committee meeting uh, was conducted by Zoom and uh, we discussed a lot about the AV uh, grant and indeed um, the sound system and the recording system is actually in place because of uh, that, uh, that grant. 
Uh, the Cosmology Interest Group was uh, held by Eden White here at the Briars. That was their second meeting, and by all accounts, I believe that went uh, really well. Later on that uh, day was uh, the moon at Oliver's Hill, and the background image on here was taken by Sylvie Grandet on the night. And Oliver's Hill is just here on uh, the left-hand side, so this is looking out uh, over the bay to, uh, to the west. And that was a, a very good night, about 150 overall during the entire evening that we were there. 3rd of October, we went to Stella Maris Primary at Beau Morris, and uh, another good night, uh, very, very uh, successful. The, uh, the school was really pleased with us, and they were fortunate enough to get um, good uh, cloud conditions, and uh, that was uh, speaking to all year levels, and uh, they, they seemed very, very impressed. Turek College uh, came here to the Briars by bus on the 5th of October. Unfortunately, they were 100% clouded out, whereas the earlier class from them, which was also Year 7s, uh, got it perfectly clear uh, a couple of months ago. So this particular second group was uh, out of luck. 7th of October saw Manfred uh, speaking here at the... Um, public night about uh, the moons of the solar system and uh, plenty of viewing was able to be uh, seen um, even though it ended up maybe on average about 50% cloud uh, during the evening. 10th of October we visited Bayside Christian College uh, again we've been there a number of times over the years and this time they were really lucky as well to have uh, no cloud and um, no uh, little little gnats which I believe um, had, had occurred once before in the past on a, on a clear evening. Lots of uh, little insects uh, came out to um, keep those on the uh, telescopes uh, happy. And the 15th of October, um, several members, I think it's at least a dozen, I think, uh, went to see uh, Brian Cox up at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre. And if you don't know who he is, there's his picture down uh, on the right-hand side. Now, coming up in the, co uh, the coming months, we've got the Telescope Learning Day, which is this Saturday here at the Briars. Um, members don't need to book, just let it, know, let, let it be known to um, those on committee that you are coming so that we have enough uh, sausages purchased. Um, there will be members and uh, public present. At the moment, um, uh, all 50 public seats have uh, been taken. Um, so barring any last minute cancellations, but that uh, doesn't apply to members. Members can uh, come to that. So that goes from four o'clock until late and uh, fingers crossed it's not uh, torrential rain on the, on the day. Uh, next committee meeting is uh, next Wednesday and then uh, the Friday afterwards we have the next quarterly Scout Cubs and Guides Night. At the moment we've got uh, actually uh, as of now 29 books. Another, another one came in just before coming and uh, we're anticipating that that may go up to about uh, 60 or so. There's another large group who wants to uh, book in as well. Public stargazing night. Um, Catherine was going to speak at that one. Unfortunately, she's had to pull out due to another engagement, so we're looking for a speaker for the uh, November meeting, so Guido has uh, kindly offered. Um, then uh, the Lunar Eclipse night, which is uh, on the 8th of uh, November. Uh, Trevor's going to give a short talk about um, the lunar eclipse. He's currently sailing the high seas off Hawaii somewhere, speaking astronomy to, uh, to the people there and enjoying himself at the same time. Uh, but he'll be back in time to, uh, to give that. And the next meeting here is uh, on the 16th of November, which is usually the last meeting for uh, the year for uh, MPAS. And early advice there, if you haven't read um, the notice that went out on East Scorpius during the week, that um, you've got uh, Brian Green coming to the Melbourne Exhibition Centre as well in April next year. And if you're interested in coming along to that, post your intention to, uh, to East Scorpius or, or let a committee member know um, because uh, there will be a group booking for that one so we'll have like a, another collective um, empaths uh, field trip up. Now Brian Green um, is shown here and um, very well known theoretical astrophysicist and uh, cosmologist if you've uh, ever seen him speaking on uh, TV. Now I'll, I'll begin with the first uh, of the uh, simulations. It goes for a couple of minutes and watch two things. This is the one where Thea, which is that, that body there about the size of Mars, uh, is colliding with the proto-Earth here and this is how the Moon came about if uh, you've not heard of uh, Thea before, came about from this uh, collision. Um, watch two things. One, the impact time, or time from the impact. So at the moment that's showing uh, 0.7 of an hour before 
first contact between the two, so keep watching that. And also look at the mixing of the layers. So you'll notice how Thea over here has a darker core and uh, the centre of the Earth has a lighter one. And watch how they mix uh, as uh, we step through this. This is the largest simulation that's ever been done. Um, it uh, broke the Earth and the, uh, the uh, Thea into 100 million particles. So in other words, it, it um, condensed the Earth down to cubes of 20 kilometres by 20 kilometres by 20 kilometres all the way through, and then proceeded to uh, run that through a uh, supercomputer. Now, that's actually a thousand times the resolution of the biggest ones that have ever been done to date for the impact. And they ran over 400 simulations of different uh, angles, different speeds, and different compositions. And uh, you'll see what happens uh, in this. So this is like a, a side-on view. And a little bit later, when we close the evening, you'll see a 3D rendered view of it instead. But this is the one so you can see what's going on on the inside. see that's barely 24 hours from the initial impact and that was one of the surprising things that came out of this high resolution study because uh, up to now it had always been assumed it was going to take about a decade to maybe a hundred years or so for the moon to coalesce and it turns out that, um, when you use much higher resolution uh, the model behaves quite differently and um, so at that higher resolution you see it, it takes barely a day for the moon to actually uh, uh, form up there. Now, the one at the end, uh, th this, this one actually comes from the scientific paper. The one shown at the end of tonight um, with the 3D rendering is the one that NASA released uh, publicly, and it uh, has words on it uh, as you go through to uh, explain what's actually occurring at uh, each of the steps as it goes through. Right, so for tonight we'll, uh, we'll look at the uh, geology of uh, asteroids and uh, comets, given that uh, certainly asteroids are uh, in the news. 
Um, this one was uh, a public lecture given at the Geological Society of London last year um, by uh, Professor Alan uh, Fitzsimmons um, and uh, he'll quite uh, openly admit that he's not a geologist, he's an astrophysicist, but uh, he's always studied um, the, uh, the geology of uh, the solar system and uh, very good uh, lectures actually underneath the Geological Society of London for uh, other objects in the solar system as well, which might uh, be shown at uh, uh, later monthly meetings. Now this will go for about an hour and then uh, what we'll do is we'll then um, have Sky for the month and uh, break for a tea break. Feel free to get up and have a cup of coffee at any time. Don't uh, feel inhibited to, uh, to do so. Uh, we'll leave the two lights on in the background just to make sure that we, uh, we see something other than uh, uh, pure darkness. Uh, now, I am not a geologist. I am as an astrophysicist by trade. And an interesting story, or perhaps interesting for me at least, is that when I was choosing to do A-levels when I was at school, uh, I had to choose between geography and physics. I ended up, end up going down the physics route, but then have spent now over 30 years studying rocks and other solid bodies orbiting our sun in our solar system. So it's interesting to me how these different sciences are actually very strongly connected. So this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're viewing from, uh, I will be very briefly covering the main aspects of what we know about these small objects that orbit our sun asteroids and comets and given its World Asteroid Day finishing with just a few words on how we are tackling the impact threat uh, from these objects. So let's go to the first slide, I'm glad that's working. Uh, it's a diagram of our solar system just to put everything into perspective and see where things are. In, this, in the left-hand side, we have the Sun in the centre of our solar system. We then have the four innermost terrestrial or rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. We then have the giant gas planets or gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, followed by the slightly smaller ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Now, those are the major planets in, in our solar system. They're the most massive objects orbiting our Sun. But between and around these uh, planets, we also have reservoirs of smaller objects that have been around for as long as the planets have been. First of all, between Mars and Jupiter, we have a region of space we call the asteroid belt, where we typically find rocky asteroids. Outside Neptune, we have a a region where we find icy objects, which if they come close to the sun, become comets. And this is what we call the Kuiper Belt or sometimes the Trans-Neptunian region. Now, it's impossible to put all of these objects, you might think, on a slide like this, and you're almost right. But we can take go from this slide where we have the planets and the sun in, just in their relative sizes, a move to a slide where we see the orbits of the planets to scale out to the planet Jupiter. So we have the Sun in the centre, then the orbits of the planet Mercury, then Venus, then Earth, then Mars, and then this gap uh, to the planet Jupiter, and then Saturn unfortunately does, doesn't fit on this slide, similarly Uranus and Neptune. Now, the first asteroid, the first object smaller than a planet seen orbiting our sun was actually discovered on the 1st of January, New Year's Day, 1801, thereby demonstrating that scientists never even get a day off for holidays if they're working. So, uh, since then, we've been scanning the skies of our telescopes to find these smaller bodies orbiting our sun. And we can flip from this graphic to a real plot of where they are. And now on this plot, what we can see 
is approximately 800,000 other objects orbiting our sun. The sun is still in the center of the plot and we still have the orbits of the planets going out to Mars and then to Jupiter. But in various different colors are different types of object orbiting our sun. If blue dots are and uh, what we call Trojan asteroids, sharing the orbit of Jupiter around the sun. Between Jupiter and Mars, we have this green belt of dots. This is the main asteroid belt, where 99.9% .9 of the rocky asteroids in our uh, solar system live. Within the asteroid belt and within the orbit of the planet Mars, we generally have most of what we call the near-Earth asteroids, objects that come closer to the Sun than Mars. And uh, these are objects I'll talk about in a little while. And then scattered liberally across this diagram, we have the comets. Now, this diagram shows the objects in our solar system as they were on a particular date, in this case, the 5th of June in the year 2019. But of course, if we to, were to watch this diagram over time, we'd see all of these objects moving in their own particular orbits or paths around the sun. And when we look at comets, we would see that these, the paths of comets is very different from the paths of the planets. If we look over on the left hand side here, I'm looking at the solar system as it is today, within about 10 astronomical units of the sun. Now an astronomical unit is the distance, the, or rather the average distance between the earth and the sun. It's how astronomers measure distances within the solar system. And so over here we can see the sun is here, uh, Earth is over here today, Mars is over there, here's Jupiter and Saturn, and here in Cyan we can see the orbit of a comet, in this case Comet 67p. And you can see it's very non-circular, it's highly elliptical in astronomical parlance, but it's not as extreme as some other comets. On the right hand side, we've zoomed out, so now we can see Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And on this scale, we can see the path of perhaps the most famous comet that orbits our sun, Comet Halley, or better known as Halley's Comet. And Halley is currently almost at the other end of its very elongated orbit. Now, the size of an orbit dictates how long it takes the object to go once around the sun through something we call Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Whereas Comet 67P here on the left has a relatively small orbit, which means it only takes roughly seven years to go once around the sun, Halley's Comet has a much larger orbit, as you can see. And in fact, it takes 76 years to go once around the sun. So I saw it, and in fact I started my astrophysical studies on Comet Halley back in 1986 when it was last around the sun. It won't be back in our neck of the woods until the year 2061. So I've kind of got my fingers crossed that modern medicine will keep me going until then. I'm hoping a lot of you, particularly the younger people watching this talk, will get to see it uh, when it comes back in another 30 odd years time. But what is a comet? Well, when Comet Halley last came around the sun, we sent an armada or spacecraft to it to image what's there. And at the heart of every comet, we have something that looks like this. This is a comet nucleus. It's a, it's a body only a few kilometers across, and it's composed of small bits of rock, we actually, we normally call comet dust, plus ice. And that's the same, mostly the same kind of ice we find here on Earth, water ice, although there are other types of ices, as we'll see. When the comet is near the sun in its orbit, the sun's heat here on the left basically heats the sunward side of the nucleus 
that lets the ices, well, they don't really melt, they sublimate. They turn immediately from a solid into a gas. You can't have a liquid in a vacuum. That's what physics tells us. So the gap, so the ice turns immediately into gas and streams away into space, also pushing out some of that original rocky dusty material. So this is what's happening in this image. We have the sun's heating coming in from the sun on the left. It's heating up the sunward side of this nucleus that's roughly 15 kilometers long. That causes ice beneath the surface of the nucleus to sublimate or turn into gas. And then that gas streams out, as you can see from the comet, bringing with it also some of these small rocky particles. So that what's hap that's what happens when a comet comes close to the sun. But this is a view from the Giotto spacecraft that the European Space Agency sent to intercept Comet Halley back in 1986. In fact, this nucleus is so small that even if we could see it through the ejected haze of gas and dust, all we'd see is a point of light. But, we, but that material, the gas and the dust that's been released, then produces what we would normally recognize as a comet because the gas and the dust, first of all, expands outwards freely from the nucleus. It's so small that gr its gravity is so weak, it can't bring it back down. And it expands into a transient or temporary atmosphere we call a coma, anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 kilometers across normally. And so here in this picture, uh, taken by an, an, a telescope in Australia back in 1986 of, of Halley's Comet, we can see this material and it's reflecting so much light, we can't actually pick out the tiny, tiny nucleus at the centre. Now, the gas itself doesn't generally stay as a normal gas, but it's ionised, it becomes electrically charged through the action of ultraviolet light from the sun. And once that happens, it's caught up in the solar wind, this stream of particles and magnetic fields that's all continuously streaming away from the sun. So the gas that's been released from the nucleus is ionized and streams back to form what we call the iron tail and the plasma tail. And in a well-developed comet like here, Halley's Comet, that iron tail can easily stretch between 1 and 10 million kilometers in length. The dust particles, these small solid particles, are also blown back from the sun, but by nothing more than sunlight reflecting off them itself in, in an effect we call radiation pressure. The very act of those little dust grains reflecting sunlight so that we can see them that continuity pushes, slowly pushes those dust grains away from the sun as well. And here we can see the dust tail of the comet. And again, in a well-developed comet, that dust tail can be uh, easily over a million kilometers long. So although the, the nucleus at the heart of a comet is incredibly tiny, just a few kilometers across, they produce this amazing spectacle when if there's enough material released, we can see it across the solar system. And the last chance in the Northern Hemisphere we had to do this really by eye was over 20 years ago now, now when Comet Hale Bop passed close to our sun. This was a giant comet. In fact, we measured the nucleus of this comet to be something like 70 kilometers across. And all of us who were alive at that time remember being able to go outside our doors to our houses at, uh, after sunset and going, look, there's a comet hanging in the sky. And it stayed there for about a month, slowly going around the sun in its orbit. It was a tremendous spectacle. Now, we saw that in the Northern Hemisphere 
if you're in the southern hemisphere you didn't actually get a great view of it but that's okay because nine years later you had this comet in the evening sky comet mcnaught in 2006 again a tremendously impressive comet that you could just go outside and see by eye which was, was there for about a week or two after sunset so comets are beautiful things to see in the night sky they're also of tremendous scientific interest and they are so interesting that we've sent several spacecraft to comets starting with the fleet or armada we sent to Halley's Comet in 1986 but the most uh, spectacular mission we've had in recent years has been the Rosetta mission from the European Space Agency which rendezvoused with a comet called 67P actually its full name is Comet 67P Churyumov Gerasimenko after the two Russian astronomers that discovered it and that's why we normally just call it Comet 67P for her brevity's sake and here we can see an image of the nucleus from Rosetta taken back in 2015 as it as it spent two years orbiting and, and flying alongside the comet. And we can see again the, the irregular nucleus itself plus the material streaming off the surface due to the heating of the sun. But I think one can see the increase in technology in terms of digital cameras from 1986 to 2015 meant that we really did get fantastic images of this comet and of course over two years we followed this comet to study not only how it changed and evolved but also what was that material releasing because we believe that comets were born at the very start of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago that's 4,600 million years in the past and as such their time capsules containing the material that was around at the birth of our solar system one of the instruments on board Rosetta was designed at, uh, to detect and measure very accurately all those different materials and molecules released by the comet as it was warmed by the sun and in this table on the left uh, published by Catherine uh, Altveg from the University of Bern in Switzerland and her, her international team we can see the, the some of the molecules that had been observed previous to Rosetta and now just some of the molecules that uh, Catherine and her team measured and you can see that it, it truly gave us a much better idea of the kinds of molecules that can, are uh, that are hidden in comets and then released when they're near the sun. Not only that, there are some very important uh, other substances or larger molecules detected. Here in this plot, where we see the number of detections against atomic weight, this is the mass of the molecule, we can see a peak due to phosphorus. Phosphorus is an incredibly important uh, element for life here on Earth. All of the cells in our bodies use phosphorus to, to communicate with each other and to function. Even more importantly, perhaps, for us thinking about uh, this subject is the detection of glycine, one of the fundamental amino acids that you find in life on earth and one of those amino acids that goes into making proteins within our bodies and the proteins of all other living things and this links back to our idea that in the distant past it may have, comets may have helped bring not only water to our planet but also the ingredients for life not life itself but they surely helped uh, uh, coat the, our earth in these carbon rich and organic chemically organic molecules from which life could first arise now it, as we're talking at the geological society i should point out of course that comet 67p was probably the most complicated small object we've ever studied in our solar system because we and we could see this detail from the cameras on Rosetta and we have consolidated solid looking terrains we have smooth terrains which seem to be covered in dust ejected 
from the comet and that's just fallen back onto the surface and even some uh, material which is non-consolidated and seems to be moving around and indeed when we compared images at the surface of the comet over the two years we could see things moving in fact some things really surprised us so on the left hand side we have a, a boulder that's about 20 meters across before the comet which is lying here before the comet reached its closest point to the sun after it was moving back outwards from the sun uh, here's another image of that region of the comet from Rosetta and you can see that the boulder has moved about 150 meters or so and it's not clear whether that was caused by material outgassing from the subsurface and pushing it along or whether or not this boulder became a mini comet itself was warmed by the sun and if it has a lot of ice in it as we expect it may have just propelled itself across the surface of this comet we also saw tremendous uh, landslides occurring on Comet 67P. So here's uh, 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 what we call the Aswan Cliffs that are roughly 100 meters high on the surface of that comet. Now, the gravity on the comet is very low. If you jump from the, the edge of this cliff down, it would take you several minutes to, to land on the surface because it's such a small body but we can see in these images here that a crack appeared during the Rosetta mission and then uh, a few months later we saw the, that material had actually fallen away into a landslide at the base of the cliffs and that corresponded with a tremendous outburst of material from the comet and there's now evidence or this was the beginnings of evidence that when we see outbursts in comets it's not caused by some kind of chemical reaction but it's caused by the geological reshaping of the comet itself. And we can't wait to go back and study more comets with our spacecraft. Moving on to asteroids. At first glance, you might think an asteroid and a comet looks very similar. But whereas comets contain huge amounts of ice in them, asteroids are pretty much predominantly rock, or at least the vast majority of them are. Now, when we again when we study asteroids with our telescopes on earth all of them apart from very largest ones appear as points of light they appear as stellar objects in our telescopes and again to see any real detail on them we need to use spacecraft and here we've got some images of from different spacecraft to scale of some of the asteroids we've visited in the past 20 or 30 years ranging from four Vesta, which is over 400 kilometers across and is one of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt, all the way down through Lutetia, Matilda, Ida, Eros, Gaspar, Steins and Frank, and then to the little half a kilometer long Itakawa, which is so small you can't really even see this on here, but I will uh, give you a better view of that uh, asteroid in a little while. Now, these are all individual worlds in their own right. And to um, really emphasize that, uh, recently NASA had the Dawn mission to Vesta and Ceres, visiting two of the largest space uh, asteroids in the asteroid belt. In fact, Ceres was the first asteroid discovered. It's the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt and in fact it's so large over 900 kilometers across as you can see here on the left that is that also known as a dwarf planet by planetary scientists and when we look at these images on the left from dawn you can see that the surface first of all is covered in craters and that's hardly surprising Ceres lies within the asteroid belt and it gets hit quite often by other asteroids leaving a crater but one can see that some of these craters some of the more recent craters such as here and here are lightly colored and that implies that there's different colored material within this, this predominantly rocky asteroid that's been revealed in these impacts 
On the right hand side, we can see one of the major results of the Dawn mission. This is a 90 kilometer wide crater on the surface of, of Ceres called Akator. And when we look in the center and over to the right, we see these very bright regions. And in fact, uh, towards the end of its mission, Dawn did some low altitude flybys to look at these in quite close detail. And these are deposits of sodium carbonates. And the belief is that these have been expelled from the surface, or for, sorry, from the subsurface of Ceres through fractures and cracks in this crater. And that it's been expelled by uh, ice or perhaps even brine, liquid water existing below the shell of this or on the crust of this largest asteroid. Now, the scientists are still pouring over the data and trying to come up with, with the best explanation of, of the measurements from Ceres, but it certainly looks as if Ceres ha certainly has subsurface ice below its crust. Whether or not any of that is in the form of liquid water, a salty brine that gave rise to these sodium carbonate deposits, we still have to have to wait and see. Perhaps we'll, we will need a, another mission back there at some point. But going from the largest asteroid to the smallest asteroid we've, we've ever visited from uh, by a spacecraft, this is image of asteroid Itakawa from the Japanese or JAXA space agency Hayabusa mission. Now, Itakawa is only half a kilometer long, but look at it. First of all, it's clearly not round. It's irregular, just as the nucleus of comet 67P and the nucleus of Halley's comet was. And that's simply because the, it's so small and its mass is so low that gravity, gravity cannot mold it into a round shape. Planets are only round because the force of gravity overcomes the strength of the rock that they're composed of. Here, what we have is a body that's so small that it, uh, that it's, that itself gravity cannot mold it into a spherical shape like a ball, like a planet. And in fact, most asteroids smaller than a hundred kilometers across are irregularly shaped. But when we look at this asteroid a little bit more closely, we see there's other strange things about it. There's very little sign of craters on the surface. I mean, there may be one there and that might be one there, but they look smooth. They don't look like the rest of the surface. And there's also kind of boulders all over the place. In fact, Itakawa is not a solid object. It's a rubble pile. Let's explain what I mean. If you take a bunch of rocks and rubble and just pile them in one place on Earth, you, you can rest them on Earth and, and you'll see this kind of mound. Now in space, if you take a large amount of material and uh, of rocks and boulders and dust of all kinds of different sizes and put them together, they'll just hold together by weak gravity but where the gravity is, is enough to hold them together, but not enough to actually mold them into a spherical shape. And so the uh, Itakawa is a prime example and was indeed the first example we visited of a rubble pile asteroid. And it's not the only one because we've recently had two very successful missions to two other small asteroids. On the left, we have the 865 meter diameter asteroid Ryugu visited by the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission. And on the right, we have the half kilometer wide asteroid Bennu but visited by NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. Now, both of these objects appear to be, again, rubble piles. They're not solid. They're just uh, agglomerations of material held together by gravity. But in these two cases, these asteroids are spinning relatively quickly. And so the spin of the asteroids has reshaped them into something that looks, well, not like a ball as such, but rather like a top hat or a spinning top. And you can see that both of these asteroids have a kind of a, a pronounced ridge along around the equator 
perpendicular to their spin axis. And again, this actually, funny enough, this was predicted to occur from comparison of radar images of asteroids that pass near the Earth, or at least small asteroids that pass near the Earth, with theoretical models about 20 years ago. And these images are proof that when we get things right, by combining the laws of physics with how rocks interact or, or, uh, out there, then we can actually understand what's going on. Now, one great thing about asteroids is that we don't just want to or don't just need to send spacecraft out because on Earth we have meteorites. We find rocks like this on the surface of the Earth that have made it to us from the asteroid belt. Now, quite often we don't know where they've come from in the asteroid belt. But even when we don't know that, when we look at them, when we cut them open and look at the materials that these samples of asteroids are composed of, we see that they, they, they have differences between them. So on the left, we see what we call an ordinary chondrit, chondrite or an ordinary chondritic meteorite. Now, ordinary chondrites, and this is one of them, are similar to the kinds of rocks we find on Earth, except they tend to have more metals, they have more iron in them. And also you would see that when you cut them open, you see these little globules of, of uh, silicate rock in them that we call chondrites. This is why we call this a normally chondrite, because most of the asteroid, or sorry, most of the samples or bits of asteroid we find falling on Earth are kind are this kind of silicate rock here. On the right hand side, we have what we call a carbonaceous chondrite. And carbonaceous chondrites also have silicate rocks in them. And you can see in this slice, we can see these circular chondrules, these globular globules of silicate rock, but they're embedded within this very dark matrix or of rock which is rich in carbon and in fact it's that carbon that gives uh, these meteorites uh, their dark color we know that carbon rich rocks uh, are dark look at coal look at graphite here on earth don't look at diamond that's a special kind of rock there and that's the, that's the subject of another geology lecture but it's the carbon in these rocks that give it uh, give these uh, asteroids and these meteorites, they're dark color. And we can detect that using telescopes from Earth. And for years, it was a puzzle why we had these two very different types of rock coming to us from the asteroid belt. And indeed, telescopic studies show that we see more, <coughs> excuse me, more of the brighter silicate rocks, silicate rich rocks in uh, towards Mars, more of the darker carbon rich asteroids towards Jupiter, but they're kind of spread throughout. How do we explain this? Well, first thing we have to do is, is look at how old are these rocks? And this is one of the most beautiful things about meteorites. Meteorites allow us through their parent asteroids to date the solar system because we can use a type of radioactive dating similar to carbon dating that we use on Earth for archaeology. For example, dating the pyramids or dating uh, 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 primitive uh, human settlements and Stone, Age, uh, and Stone Age settlements here in the UK and around the world. What we, we, we need to do, however, is not use the carbon in meteorites, but we need to use longer lived elements because carbon dating can only take us back about 50,000 years or so. We're, when we go to asteroids, we need to use materials that allow us to use radioactive dating uh, that last billions of years. And in this case, we've, we see three diagrams where we, uh, as scientists have used isotopes of lead to it date the parts of those meteorites. And what, co what so-called cosmochemists, that is scientists who look at the chemistry and the history of meteorites and asteroids have found is that whenever they go to an ordinary chondrite or carbonaceous chondrite, look for the, particularly for the oldest material they can find, they always find the same age, 4,000, 
567 million years. And it, therefore it's from asteroids and meteorites that we date the age of our solar system. Our sun and all of the planets and the asteroids and the comets that, for, that for, formed the solar system began life 4.567 billion years ago. And in fact, this technique is so precise that we can separate that formation date from other material. In fact, the chondrules uh, that we find within meteorites formed over a period of 3 million years after the start of the solar system. The precision is incredible. And it just shows you what uh, the cosmochemists and the other scientists involved in this work kind of work can uh, do in terms of accuracy. And so that sets the scene of how long our solar system has been around. But asteroids just don't date our solar system. They give us clues to what happened in the first few million years while the asteroids and the planets and the comets were forming. Because we see, seem to uh, know now that the giant planets formed very quickly within a few million years. And we think our original solar system looked a bit like this, with the giant planets forming first due to Saturn, Eunice and Neptune. They would have all been a bit, a bit smaller than they are now, but they would have formed first. But no terrestrial planets. And then the, then the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, and also to a lesser extent Eunice and Neptune, started throwing the asteroids and the and the newly formed comets around and that helped move the planets through simple physics through the conservation of momentum and in, with something called the conservation of angular momentum and that would have moved Jupiter inwards towards the sun it's something we see in other solar systems so-called exoplanet systems these days where we see giant planets very close to their parent stars and when Jupiter moved in it basically compressed over a few tens of thousands of years, all those rocky asteroids to be in a, in a very high density place close to the sun, that allowed those asteroids to collide with each other, form larger and larger bodies, and kick off the process of forming the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, we're lucky that Jupiter stopped there, and it seemed to stop there and actually then move back because in our solar system, we had another massive planet a little bit further out, Saturn. And the interaction between Saturn and Jupiter pulled both of those planets back outwards, thereby allowing the formation of our Earth to continue relatively uninterrupted, but also at the same time, continuing to scatter uh, around the rocky asteroids that were used to be within Jupiter and the ice, more icy bodies that used to be outside Jupiter. And this so-called Grand Tack model explains not only the formation of the Earth along with, its, with the other terrestrial planets, but also why we see these asteroids of different materials uh, in the asteroid belt today. Now, there's a lot of detail that still needs to be worked out with this model, but it already does give us at least a, 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 a gross idea of how things were happening in the early solar system. Now, that was then, this is now. The planets are pretty much fixed in their orbits because, we, uh, because there aren't enough asteroids and comets to be thrown around to, to actually move them appreciably in their orbits. But clearly, sometimes we do find asteroids and comets not in their normal orbits, but passing close to the Earth. So first of all, to follow up the, uh, our current discoveries of asteroids and comets, we have a whole range of uh, missions coming up to us. We have later this year the launch of the NASA Lucy mission which is going to fly by seven of these Trojan asteroids showing Jupiter's orbit between 2027 and 2033. It's going to take six years for all those flybys to take place. Next year, we have the launch of the Psyche mission, which is going to go to the largest metal-rich asteroid in the asteroid belt, 
known as psyche and that's going to run over and going to orbit about it and try to study what we believe is the exposed core of the protoplanet that didn't manage to make it to full planethood in the early days of the solar system. Japan will launch the Destiny Plus mission in three years time which is going to visit a peculiar asteroid that can come near the earth called Phaethon and it's going to reach there in 2028 and then that year that uh, the Japanese spacecraft Destiny Plus reaches Phaethon, a uh, European Space Agency will launch its comet interceptor led by UK scientists, which will go out and, and visit, hopefully, a long period comet direct coming in from the very outskirts of our very boundaries of our solar system to study very pristine material. But as I, I, met, I mentioned, um, uh, today is Asteroid Day, and it's named after the last significant or, or large impact uh, we had on Earth in 1908, when a 50 meter diameter asteroid uh, entered the Earth's atmosphere, didn't make it to the ground, it exploded at low altitude, but then that shockwave destroyed 2,000 kilometers of forest. That was then, you wouldn't want to be under uh, that explosion when it occurred. Uh, of course, uh, it happened in a re remote area of Tunguska, but we can get larger impacts. So for example, if you've ever been to Arizona, you may have met, met this, visited this place, Meteor Crater in the United States, where 49,000 years ago, a much more energetic asteroid hit and formed a crater a mile wide and in fact uh, it left so many fragments of it I've got one even in, in my home office here here's a fragment of the asteroid that made that crater and to give you some kind of idea of scale for for this uh, crater hopefully you can see over here that on this day I was visiting some of my colleagues were trekking into the crater itself and maybe you can just see them if not let's zoom up this truly shows the scale of devastation even a small asteroid can make on the surface of the Earth. So how are we protecting ourselves from these impacts in the future? Well, first of all, we're trying to find these objects. We find that the idea is that we find them in their orbits uh, well before they hit, hit us. And why do we want to do that? Well, here's what our Earth would look like if we didn't have plate tectonics and our atmosphere in the oceans. Basically, if we were effectively an, an atmosphereless, oceanless world, we would look like the moon. And tonight, if it's clear and you've got a small pair of binoculars, go out and look at the moon. Each one of those craters on the moon was formed by an asteroid or a comet hitting it. And our moon is in the same region of the solar system as we are. And so uh, this really shows you how uh, our inner solar system has been pummeled by asteroids and comets over the past 4.6 billion years. Well, to help us track these objects, we have telescopes. And on the left hand side, we can see uh, typically what we get out from these so-called near Earth asteroid survey telescopes. And we can see in this sequence of four images that's looping a little dot of light that's indicated by a red cross. That's a new near Earth asteroid that we discovered today uh, with the Atlas near Earth asteroid survey facility in Hawaii. In fact, it was reported approximately an hour before I started this talk. And we don't know exactly where it is at the moment, but uh, looking at the motion of the asteroid, we believe this is passing us a rough uh, today, roughly twice the distance of the moon. And at that distance, this object is probably about between 50 and 80 meters across. So kind of Tunguska meteor crater sized uh, impactor. And, and the job of these telescopes is to locate and find these objects. And they're doing it incredibly well. On the right hand side, we have a, a, a plot 
of the number of these neuroastroids we've discovered against time since 1980. And you can see, if we just follow the blue line, that we're doing tremendously well to today, we have over 26,000 near Earth asteroids that have now been discovered, plus another 114 near Earth comets. So that's how we discover them. And once we've discovered them, we can track them, calculate their orbits and predict where they're going in the future by using Newton's law of gravity. At some point, we will discover an asteroid that is going to hit us in the future. So what do we do about it? Well, we've got three main techniques that we think we could use at the moment. On the left, we have the gravity tractor. And that idea is that if you've got a small asteroid that's going to hit us, say, in 20 years or so, we could launch a large spacecraft and hover it over the asteroid. And the gravitational attraction uh, or caused by the spacecraft on the asteroid would slowly pull that asteroid into a, a slightly different orbit. So 20 years down the line, it, rather than hitting us, it would sail safely by. In the middle, we have the kinetic impactor. This is using the law of conservation of momentum from physics, that if you hit something very fast, with a body, that object will then move in the same direction. And the idea of a kinetic impactor is to hit us, is to fire a sm small spacecraft at an asteroid that will again move it onto a slightly different path and prevent a, an impact it by that asteroid on Earth in the future. Now, we've got a very large asteroid, or we don't have years of warning from our telescopes, then we could, in principle, refer to blast deflection, where we explode a large explosive device, perhaps a nuclear device, near the surface of an asteroid. And again, that vaporizes the surface, the vaporized material goes one way, and the asteroid moves the other way, and, we put, and we've changed the orbit of that asteroid. Up to now, these are all theories and, and models on paper and in scientists and engineers' computers. We've never tested it, but we're going to now. Because later this year, we launched the first of two spacecraft in a collaboration known as the Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment Collaboration, or AIDA. And the two spacecraft are the NASA DART mission and the ESA HERA mission. And it's DART that will launch in November this year. It will spend a few months traveling just a little bit away from Earth because in September next year, we'll have a near-Earth asteroid near us called Didymos. DART was not going to hit Didymos, but it turns out that Didymos, which is roughly 800 meters across, has a small moon going around it that's 160 meters across called Dimorphos. And so the DART mission will actually hit the asteroid's moon, Dimorphos, and it will change the orbit of that moon around its parent asteroid. And that's something we can measure from Earth. So we will be able to show via the DART mission that we can change the orbital path of a small asteroid. Now, of course, unfortunately, in this uh, mission, the DART spacecraft itself will be completely destroyed. And although it will have uh, an Italian small satellite, a CubeSat called Leisure Cube, uh, uh, that it will release a few days before the impact, uh, to show us the initial stages of what happens to Dimorphos. We won't have a full picture from Leisure Cube. So in 2024, in three years time, we will launch the HERA mission from Earth. And in December 2026, it will arrive and rendezvous with the Didymos Dimorphos system. And it will spend up to a year in that system, measuring the properties of this, not only Dimorphos, but also its parent asteroid Didymos, but importantly, measuring exactly what happened 
to Demorphus. It will also carry two small CubeSats to help uh, completely characterize the effect of the DART impact on Demorphus. And through all of these measurements, we'll know how easy or how hard it is to move even a small asteroid from its predicted path onto a new safe orbit. And by doing that, we hope to give future generations some security against asteroid impacts. So to finish, um, just to summarize, icy comets orbit the sun, but they erode as they travel around the sun. They release that material into their tails, and that's what forms these glorious things we can sometimes see in the sky. But that very nature, but that very act of rejecting that material changes and erodes the shape of the nucleus at their cores. Rocky asteroids evolve through collisions and breakups, something I haven't had time to go, for, go into much uh, this afternoon, but they hold a wealth of information about the evolution and the history of our solar system. It is why we find them such fascinating objects to, to investigate. Then finally, of course, both asteroids and comets impact on occasion the inner planets, including the Earth. But there's major work underway to find them, track them, and now finally we're going to test whether or not we can divert them in the future. So I hope you found that interesting. I hope you found, found you've learned some things today. And I guess now I'll stop and we'll go over to uh, any questions that may have come in. Um, to kick us off, someone has asked, do comets rotate because of the gases leaking like jets? Why aren't they spinning faster and faster until they're torn apart? That's a brilliant question. Okay, so first of all, pretty much everything in the universe rotates. Uh, the sun rotates, the earth rotates, uh, asteroids and comets rotate, galaxies rotate. But the interesting thing about comets is that you're absolutely right. When they eject material, they can actually change their spin. And in fact, depending on whether or not, which way the material is coming out from the comet, it can spin it up or slow it down. And so we believe that some comets have probably spun themselves up so fast that they've broken apart. And in fact, one comet that passed close to the Earth that was studied from Earth, we didn't have a spacecraft there, a comet called 41P, sorry, uh, 46P Vertinin, uh, was studied uh, just uh, two or three years ago, and it was found that it, it actually doubled its rotation as it, as it went around the sun once. So the rotation rate can change. Now, the bigger the comet, the harder it is to do because the more mass there is. So basically, the harder it is to turn it by the, the physical effect we call torque. Uh, but this could be a reason why, although we see small asteroids down to only a few hundred meters across and even smaller down to tens of meters. There are very, very, very few small comets. We've only found a few that are a few hundred meters across. Normally they're about one or two kilometers across or larger. And it could be because of this effect that you've asked about, about comets spinning themselves up until eventually they just disrupt and fly apart. Wow, that's amazing, thank you. Um, next up, someone has asked, is it safe to send humans to explore comets and can we even do that? Um, it, we can't do it at the moment and explain why. First of all, uh, uh, we don't currently have, we've only got on, on planned a working system through NASA that could send astronauts as far as the moon. And generally comets are much, much further than that. And to get to the comet, comet rendezvous with it and come back would take several years. And that's not something we can do at the moment. Now, is it safe to do it if we could do it? And that's a good question. It's gonna be tricky because when the comet's near the sun, You've seen that they eject this material, this gas and this dust. And these dust particles be, can be traveling at several hundred meters per second, some of them. And so if you've got to have a manned mission 
at, at a comet, you would need some kind of shielding against this kind of continuous peppering of dust particles. In fact, when Rosetta, which of course was a robotic unmanned spacecraft, was at, was at Comet 67P, when the comet was most active, it actually moved away from the comet and spent all of its time about 100 kilometers, between 50 and 100 kilometers from the, from the comet to make sure it wasn't damaged by that material coming out. So you could send astronauts to comets, but the safest time to do it is when they're far from their sun in their orbits and they're not being heated enough by the sun to release that material. But then, of course, it would take longer to, for the astronauts to get out there. So I hope we do visit comets one day in person, but I think that's going to be in the far future. I think so too. <laughs> it does sound pretty complicated. Um, kind of leading on from that, actually, someone has asked, what's the density of the material in the comet's tail um, and how much of that does it lose during every pass of the sun? Well, OK, so, th so uh, I'll ask those questions in reverse order. Okay. First of all, how much material does a comet lose from the sun? It varies from comet to comet. Some comets only give out very small amounts of material. Some comets, like Halley's Comet, for example, give out huge amounts of material. In fact, uh, when Halley was nearest the sun, it was releasing something like four tons of water uh, per second and a similar amount in dust particles. Um, and that means that every time, for example, Halley goes around the sun, it loses about a meter thickness of its surface. So if you go, if you could go into the far future, if you could go in the future about a million years, Halley's Comet won't exist anymore. It would have completely lost all of its material. And we think it would have just completely vaporized. Um, if we go to 67P, when it was closest to the sun, or uh, actually in that orbit, it lost on average about 1.8 meters of material from its southern surface, which is pointing uh, towards the sun when it was closest to it. But actually some of that material actually didn't escape the comet and landed back on the northern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere actually grew a bit which is kind of interesting then. So comets are losing a lot of material all the time. But then as they travel out, that material travels out into the tails, uh, the density gets lower and lower and lower. And in fact, the amazing thing about comet tails is that the density of particles in a comet tail is lower than the best vacuum we can achieve in a physics laboratory on Earth. We can see them because there's so much material in total to, to reflect the sunlight. But if you're traveling through a comet tail, you wouldn't notice the effect and you'd need sensitive, very sensitive instruments to even figure out you were doing that. In 1910, the, the passage of Halley's Comet before last, Halley, uh, Halley's Comet actually came very close to the Earth and we, the Earth passed through the tail of the comet. And interestingly, because uh, scientists had just measured the gas cyanogen in the head of the comet, in the coma, which is a poisonous gas, uh, there was a great um, kind of uh, kind of fake uh, or scam going on where people were being sold comet pills to protect them against the effects of passing through the tail of Halley's comet. And of course, there wasn't anything. It was just flour and water and a bit of sugar, I think, um, it had no effect on the Earth's atmosphere or the effect of the Earth at all because the, the density is so low. So it's quite incredible that uh, comets can be really, really bright, but the density of material there is really, really small. Okay. Um, another, actually, I'm going to go for a completely different question now. <laughs> okay. um, someone has asked, how will the rise of mega constellations of satellites affect the ability to detect new near-Earth objects. So okay, so let me, you know, that's all right. Let me explain. Right now, there, there's a number of projects, uh, uh, particularly from, from SpaceX and Amazon in the United States, to launch constellations of hundreds or even thousands of, of satellites around the Earth to provide internet wherever you are on the Earth. And, you know, you might think that's a good thing. And that is a good thing because the internet is for everything bad that's said about it, it allows us to uh, impart information to each other as we're doing now. Um, 
But of course, uh, when those satellites uh, are going over an observatory, particularly near uh, dawn and, and dusk, they reflect sunlight and they'll, they'll cause large bright streaks across our telescope sensors as they look for near Earth asteroids and comets. Now, understanding exactly what the effect it will be is actually quite difficult. There's been a number of studies on that. And it seems that the, the effect won't be too dramatic. We will still be able to do our surveys, but there will be some objects we miss because of this explosion in the number of satellites orbiting the Earth. Uh, so, and we are, in fact, uh, working with and talking with those companies involved to try and mitigate this, to make the satellites less reflected and reflective and see and actually be able to plan ahead where those satellites will be in their orbits. But it will be a problem for us. Saying that, we have a problem now because uh, I was looking through images earlier today, searching for new near-Earth asteroids, as you've seen, and, and comets, and we get lots of satellite streaks today. So um, it will be a problem, but uh, it won't stop that effort completely. Uh, it, it will probably be a minor problem, I think, but let's just hope we don't miss something we need to spot. Definitely, yeah. Um, next up we have a question, which is, can we tell which asteroids are made from rubble piles? If near-Earth asteroids made like them are likely to collide with Earth, are they the ones to blow up or uh, so that small meteorites enter the atmosphere? Okay, that, that, uh, so there's two questions kind of there again, I'll, I'll, I'll report them. <laughs> First of all, how do we, no, that's okay. How do we work out uh, whether or not an asteroid is a rubble pile or not. Actually, it's quite difficult, but uh, we see, we believe now that almost all asteroids that are smaller than 10 kilometers across are rubble piles, either near Earth or in the asteroid belt. Looking at our models and our calculations of the hit, their history over the four and a half last, sorry, 4.6 billion years. Uh, one, one way we confirm that is that we can measure how fast they spin. Because if you're only held together by gravity, then if you spin too fast, the, the centrifugal force from that rotation will overcome gravity and the asteroid will fall apart. And when we look at small asteroids between, say, uh, uh, 200 metres across and uh, 10 kilometres across, almost none of them are spinning faster than once every two, two and a quarter hours, which is the limit for this. Now we do see smaller asteroids spinning faster and so there are a bunch of uh, smaller asteroids a uh, hundred meters across, 50 meters across, even 20 meters across that might be solid but even then we're not sure. So we're kind of really, to, to, to summarize, we're pretty sure that everything between a hundred meters across and 10 kilometers across is probably uh, by and large, a rubble pile. Smaller than that, most of them probably are, but we're not completely sure. So that's how we know. F finally, very quickly, um, would would the idea be to, to smash them into smithereens if um, if they're on an impact trajectory? So we we just get a meteor shower when those things hit the Earth. Well, we could in theory, and that's something we could try, but we can't do it too close to the Earth. You would still have to do it when it's well before impact, because otherwise, if you do it, you know, say, say a day out, the material from that smashed asteroid won't have time enough to disperse. So it will still all come in to the atmosphere at the same time, and it will still cause a bit of a mess. So uh, even with a small rubble pile asteroid, we would still want to try to deflect it or even disperse it um, a long time before impact, uh, months, if not years. Okay. Um, I'm very aware of time, so I think we've just got time for a couple more questions, uh, if that's okay. Sure. Let's, <laughs> I'm going all over the place with subject matter here. Um, someone has asked, what determines the visible colour of a comet's tail? Oh, that's a good question. Well, actually, you can, is this, my slide still showing? Uh, your last slide is, yeah. Yeah, great, because on the right we, we have comet Neowise that was visible in the summer skies last year and you can see this beautiful blue 
color? Well, it's because this is the, first of all, this is the plasma tail or the iron tail. And, it, and this is particularly, in this tail, we've got ionized water and ionized carbon monoxide and ionized all kinds of other gases. Now, if we look at water, water isn't, ionized water isn't very good at reflecting sunlight because of the structure of the molecule. But ionized carbon monoxide is really good at reflecting sunlight in the blue region of the spectrum. So when we look at an iron tail and we take pictures of it with digital cameras, it's almost always blue because we're seeing the, the efficient reflection of sunlight by carbon monoxide. When we go over here and we look at the dust tail, dust particles, even though, even though they're microscopic, are solid particles. So they reflect all colors of light, just as anything else would, would. So what we're seeing here is basically reflected sunlight. And it's if we measure it very accurately, we see it's slightly redder than our sun because the dust particles reflect more red light than blue light. But we see this kind of, you know, perhaps yellowish color or uh, fading into gray here because those dust particles are reflecting all wavelengths and all colors of sunlight. Okay. And finally, we have the question, what are the possibilities of mining asteroids and comets? Well, I've got no doubt this is going to happen at some point, but again, it's not going to happen in the near future. There have been a number of companies um, uh, set up in recent years to look, to investigate the possibility of mining asteroids in terms of natural resources. And, and in particular, they would mine near Earth asteroids. They are closest to us. They're the easiest ones to get to. But the question is, what do you want to mine? Because right now, e, uh, e, if you want to mine, say, uh, precious elements such as gold or platinum or rare earth elements, um, uh, which, which are important for our technological uh, industry these days, um, uh, it actually would cost much more to go there, try to extract them and bring them back than it, would, than it is just to mine them on earth. It's not economically feasible at the moment. But one thing we could do, however, is mine icy asteroids or comets because they contain water. And if you take water and split it up into hydrogen and oxygen, those are your basic constituents of rocket fuel. So one reason to mine uh, uh, asteroids, if we find them with ice in them, and particularly comets, is that you can make rocket fuel. And it means that if you're going to continue your exploration of the solar system, you don't need to take the fuel with you you can refuel as you go. And so that's really what something that might happen, say in the next century or so. But right, we are really at the start of learning how different comets and asteroids can be and, and trying to figure out how to interact with them. So it's going to be a while. Wow, I didn't think this lecture was gonna go in the direction of, you know, fuel stations in space, but there we are. That's, uh, that's really, really fascinating. And I just, you know, thank you so much for joining us and giving this lecture today, Alan. It's been really, really brilliant. Okay, Sky uh, for the month for October 2022. Uh, obviously, the year is uh, moving fairly quickly at the moment. And, uh, We've got a couple of things coming up uh, and a few things worth having a look at. So uh, during October and November 22, things to watch for. Uh, the new, uh, sorry, the full moon this month occurred on the 10th uh, of this month, so we're actually past it. The new moon is on the 25th, uh, so only about a couple of days away. And the next full moon... Uh, will be the 8th to the 11th, and a very special one because it's going to be a total lunar eclipse. And uh, I've got a little bit more about that towards the end of the uh, presentation. Over the course of uh, the next few weeks, uh, things to look for is the Orion its meteor shower. Uh, reaches its maximum on the 21st to the 10th. Not sure what the weather's going to be like, but... Uh, 
Uh, it, it operates from the 2nd to the 10th to the 7th to the 11th, but uh, around about the 21st to the 10th, it'll be at its maximum. Uh, MPAS Telescope Learning Day, uh, very important event, 22nd to the 10th. So uh, particularly the new members, if you've got a telescope and you want to learn how to use it, bring it along. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to set it up and have a play with it. Uh, that starts at 4 p.m. On the 23rd of the 10th, uh, Venus is in superior conjunction, which means it's on the other side of the Sun from us. It's in conjunction with the Sun, so we can't really see it. And uh, because it's on the other side, it's referred to as superior conjunction, the other conjunction being when it's between us, and that's its inferior conjunction. Comet Pan-Stars uh, is back in Scorpio uh, on the 26th of the 10th. It's 1.8 degree west of NGC 6124, uh, which is an open cluster in Scorpio. As the month progresses, uh, it'll move into... Uh, uh, around the 7th to the 11th, it's uh, in the constellation of Norma, which uh, the next slide will show you where that is. Uh, Ceres, now I put uh, Ceres here, a bit topical given we've been talking about asteroids and that sort of stuff. Ceres is the, uh, the biggest of the uh, objects in the asteroid belt and is given the status of a minor planet. And it'll be about 0.1 degree, which uh, is very, very close to uh, NGC uh, 3628, which is a galaxy in Leo. Uh, apparently it's up in the, uh, up near the head of Leo or something. Uh, so for those who want to go asteroid hunting, that might be a good opportunity. Uh, Comet Pan-Stars uh, in Norma. Uh, on the 8th to the 11th, uh, as I said, total lunar eclipse. We, uh, we do have an event uh, happening here. And on the 9th of the 11th, Mercury goes into superior conjunction. So both Mercury and Venus are on the other side of the Sun from us. Now the interesting thing here is when both of them come out of superior conjunction, they will return to the evening sky, so they'll be evening objects. And uh, Mercury will actually appear before Venus, even though it goes into superior conjunction after Venus. So it gives you a bit of an idea of just how fast Mercury is going. 88 days to go once around the sun. So it pretty well goes from superior conjunction to maximum elongation in about 22 days. So fairly quick. Venus, on the other hand, takes 267 days to go around the sun. So time taken to travel quarter of its orbit, it's about 67 days. So just over two months. Uh, which is why it will follow Mercury into the evening sky. On the 9th to the 11th, uh, Uranus is at opposition. Uh, best time to observe it, uh, try and find it. it. It does appear as a greenish blue dot in most telescopes. Uh, but if there's anything else in the vicinity of it, it might be a little hard to find. And from the 20th to the 10th to uh, the 10th to the 12th, we've got the Northern Taurus meteor shower. And uh, that maxes out on the 13th to the 11th. But a lot of these meteor showers, the best time to see them is probably after midnight. So looking at the, uh, the sky, uh, if, uh, this is looking to the south. So um, obviously what's happening now is we're saying goodbye to Scorpio as we move into a, a summer sky and we start to get Orion uh, entering the picture. Uh, with it obviously comes uh, the Orion Nebula, which is a very easy one for particularly newer astronomers to, to find and uh, pretty spectacular in a telescope. Uh, those looking to have a look at a glob globular cluster, uh, you've got 47 Takana up here. You will actually be able to find that if you're looking in the vicinity uh, of that area uh, of the Takana there, you will see it in your finder scope. So, you can line it up and then have a look through your telescope with it. Um, obviously, uh, the other one, uh, Amiga Centauri, is, is not in an ideal position for viewing at the moment. The, uh, these are other objects up here, your wild duck cluster, uh, M7. Uh, these are around the tail of Scorpio, um, uh, which has actually got quite a few 
uh, objects there, as does uh, Antares. Looking to the north, um, you know, I was trying to find, so I'll actually go back for a sec. So when you're looking at Scorpio, for that, uh, those who want to go pan stars hunting, it's moving uh, out of the head of Scorpius. So well, that's the tail there, the head's down here. This is Norma. So the way to find it is it's kind of between the South Celestial Pole, uh, which is up here in Octans, and Antares. So it's just a little, little south of Scorpio. So those looking for pan stars, that's where you need to look. Um, looking to the north, which we don't have a very good northern horizon here, which is a shame because we now have Pegasus up. And uh, below that is Andromeda with its uh, Andromeda galaxy. So if you can get somewhere dark that you don't have to swim to at the moment, uh, and with a good northern horizon, that is a, an object you can perhaps have a look at. The planets, uh, as I said, Mercury is moving into superior conjunction on the 9th. Uh, it fairly quickly returned to the evening sky. And hopefully it'll be a little bit higher than it was while it was uh, in the morning sky there. Uh, it'll be fairly close to Venus once Venus makes an appearance. So you'll be able to get those those two planets. Uh, which probably means you'll be able to just about get all eight. Especially given with Mars coming back. Uh, Venus, superior conjunction on the 23rd of this month. But uh, it's much slower so it won't return to the sky uh, the evening sky until uh, sometime in December. Uh, Earth moving into a position for a total lunar eclipse, which basically means the uh, the moon is moving through one of its uh, various nodes, because the actual moon is inclined at about five degrees to the ecliptic plane. So it spends a fair bit of its time above it, the other half below it. So we only get eclipses either lunar or uh, solar eclipses when the moon gets between earth and the sun or the earth gets between moon and the sun when it's traveling through one of those uh, ascending or descending nodes and uh, that occurs on the 8th of the 11th and uh, we will be having an event here for it keep stressing that you get there and uh, <laughs> Okay, Mars is now rising uh, late in the evening eastern sky, so uh, it's, uh, it's heading towards opposition, which is, I think, either late November or early December. And uh, the interesting thing there is it, it's not coming to us, we're actually catching it, which is something we do every two years. Uh, it's in the head of Taurus at the moment, uh, and it uh, will start to increase its apparent size. So uh, it's hopefully going to be uh, worth having a look at shortly. Uh, Jupiter is uh, the, the one bright object up in the uh, the eastern sky at the moment. You can't miss Jupiter. It's, uh, it's in a fairly dark patch of sky, and it's just the brightest object there. Uh, Saturn is almost straight up at the moment. Um, it is, both of those are actually through opposition, which uh, means around about nine, ten o'clock, they're in a uh, fairly good viewing position for us, even though they're not quite as close as they were at opposition. Uh, Uranus is in Aries, and it's uh, rising in the east just after sunset now. So the one thing you'll get from this, Neptune, is between Saturn and Jupiter, so all four of the gas planets are in about the same part of the sky. A little frustrating when we do outreach programs because uh, we've got either all planets or none. So the appearance of the planets, uh, obviously as Mercury and Venus move into uh, or towards their superior conjunctions, uh, it's as far away from us as it gets, so it's relatively small uh, dot. Now apparently, uh, as Mercury moves into superior conjunction uh, this time, because of the uh, every planet at certain times spends time above and below the ecliptic plane, it apparently is going to occult the sun. So <laughs> I don't know whether the sunscape will uh, be able to pick it up, 
But, uh, yeah, as it passes through Superior Conjunction, it's actually going to skim across the top of the sun. So it might be worth having a look at. Um, Mars, as you can see, Mars is getting much bigger now. That's because we're uh, approaching it. it. It doesn't get a lot bigger than that, but uh, we are heading into the best time to start viewing Mars. Uh, Saturn still, uh, still have the rings. We've got them for another three years at least before we pass through the ring plane. And uh, Jupiter, always spectacular. And Uranus and Neptune, depending on what sort of size you see, that's about as much detail as you'll get with both of them. Other stuff, pan stars. Uh, it starts October in Lupus. It's moved back into Scorpio uh, by now. And then towards the end of October, it'll move into Norma. It's around about six magnitude, which is fairly bright for a comet. So uh, well worth having a look at if you uh, want to try your hand at comet chasing. Meteor showers, the southern Taurids from the 10th to the 9th to the 20th to the 11th, peaking on the 10th to the 10th. So they've already peaked, but they're, uh, they're still, uh, still visible. And they're associated with Comet Enki. And the Orionids, which will be visible from the uh, 2nd to the 10th to the 7th to the 11th, so now. Best viewed uh, probably from about midnight to dawn or certainly late in the evening until dawn, uh, known to produce around about 20 meteors per hour. So uh, probably a, a worthwhile display to at least stay up until about 1 o'clock and hopefully see a few. And uh, they're fairly swift and bright, and they're associated with Halley's Comet. Stuff it left behind. So to the upcoming events. This Saturday we've got the uh, Telescope Learning Day. Uh, starting on uh, starting about 4 p.m., uh, you can sort of get here, set up your telescopes. We do have a talk, and uh, just you doing your practical demo this year. I'll put it on the list for you. <laughs> um, so it includes a talk, a sausage sizzle, a uh, bunning style sausage sizzle. Uh, will be held because we've got the 50 members of the public attending as well. Members can come along. There's no limit on members. The public, we're limited to 50. And uh, obviously, Tuesday the 8th of November, starting around 6pm. Uh, that's if you want to get here and get your scope set up, uh, ready to uh, check it all out, is the total lunar eclipse. And going by Peter's graphic at the start there, we're not going to see an absolute total one. Where we are, we seem to get it just leaves that little bright spot on the side of it every time, every total eclipse. It's never been quite total. Um, a brief talk, uh, hopefully by Trevor, uh, if he gets back, doesn't hit an iceberg or something, and uh, on how eclipses happen. Tonight's information provided by Astronomy 22, uh, Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Any questions? Yes, Phil. Sorry, sorry, mate. Yeah. Not, not at the mo not at the mo not at the moment. Um, it's in superior conjunction. It's pretty close to superior conjunction, so uh, it's it's the other side of the sun uh, at the moment. You'll need to wait until December, and it'll pop up in the evening, and you won't miss it. It'll be the brightest thing in the western sky. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Greg. Well, this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> that, that was actually included in um, uh, that that uh, there that there's a couple of double transits and I think at one stage there's only one moon visible so the others are either hiding behind it or I uh, know there's one in front of it yeah yeah so they're they're coming up there's, there's quite a few uh, moon transits of uh, Jupiter tonight in the morning so you got the uh, observatory open clear night you're here all night. Okay, so anyone wants to join Greg all night, feel free. <laughs> 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 
A any other questions? Yes. Fireballs. Oh, the uh, that was in the um, yeah uh, the southern, southern Torrids. Um, they have the occasional fireball, a uh, fairly bright. Well, fireball obviously. Most meteors are just a, a, a streak, uh, and that sort of stuff. Uh, sorry. Okay, um, the Southern Torrids were associated with Comet uh, Enki. So as Enki went uh, across Earth's orbit, um, as you saw, it, it deposits a whole heap of material uh, as it goes through. And I guess it would depend on how big the chunk was that uh, it came off. I mean, most of it's fairly small and that sort of stuff, but occasionally you might get a, a fairly significant size one that actually... Uh, comes off as well and once we go through it when that chunk hits the atmosphere it's going to produce a, a much brighter more specky display than what uh, the smaller stuff will but mo most of it's just the smaller stuff uh, and so you'll just get the streaks and, uh, and that sort of stuff but apparently uh, it, what it stated was there is the occasional or potential for the occasional fireball so that's just the bigger stuff coming off the tail Something substantial here. <laughs> but it just depends on what came off the comet at what time and uh, whether it hits our atmosphere or, or not. But it's as the Earth travels through the tail of, of the residue left by Comet uh, Anki. Uh, the Orionids, they're uh, passing through the tail of uh, Halley's Comet. So uh, fairly swift bright, which would suggest most of what's come off Halley's Comet is, is grains of sand. Uh, that sort of stuff. No worries. Yes. Yeah. Most of them are just a streak. And if you don't happen to be looking at the right part of the sky at the time, you miss it. But some of the fireballs can be a little bit slower. Uh, there's one in Russia a few years ago that that was a decent fireball, <laughs> and uh, the, but that would have been a fairly sizable chunk of rock. And I think it actually exploded in the upper atmosphere too. So uh, the really big ones that do the fireballs do tend to blow up before they actually hit us. Just don't be under it. <laughs> Any others? Okay, thank you. Can a moon have a moon? Well, yes, in theory it can. And yet, we don't see any examples of this in our solar system. So why is that? The first important thing to know is that all celestial objects have gravitational pull. That includes tiny little asteroids, all the way to giant stars or even black holes. The mass of an object dictates how strong its gravitational pull is. A region around an object where its gravitational influence is greater than any other celestial object near them is called its hill sphere. Due to the mass of our Earth, it has a hill sphere which has a radius of 1.5 million kilometers, meaning that if you were within this hill sphere, you would be pulled more towards Earth than towards the Sun. If the Earth was closer to the Sun, its hill sphere would be smaller, and if it was further away, it would be larger. 
the Sun also has its own Hill Sphere, which contains the entire solar system. Its Hill Sphere is massive, almost two light years radius, as the nearest celestial object its gravity is competing against are other stars. Which means, in a way, everything orbiting our Sun is the Sun's moon, or rather, its satellite. The term moon is really reserved for satellites of planets. So why don't moons also have natural satellites? Well, lots of moons are extremely close to their parent planets, meaning their hill spheres are very small. Let's take our moon as an example. Against the Earth, the hill sphere of the moon is only 60,000 kilometers radius, or only one-sixth of the distance from the moon to the Earth. Moons like Io have an even smaller hill sphere, as it is competing against the gravity of Jupiter. This makes it quite hard for moons to capture an object, but not technically impossible. So surely there must be a moon that has a natural satellite somewhere, right? Well, most moons also have one other major problem. They tend to be tidally locked to their parent planet. Because of this, any satellite that orbits a tidally locked object will have its orbit decay from tidal forces until it eventually crashes into the moon. Now this still takes a lot of time over astronomical standards, but it means if any of the moons in our solar system did have a satellite at one point, chances are that it has since crashed into it. This leaves one question I think. Why don't moons of planets also eventually crash? The difference is that none of our planets are tidally locked to the Sun, as they are far enough away from the parent star, which means their moons have a stable orbit. This is one of the reasons we believe that none of the TRAPPIST system planets have moons, as they are so close to their parent star that we assume the planets are all tidally locked. I hope this didn't disappoint you too much, so I'm going to leave you with this. There are some other curious objects in the solar system, far away from any other object, so that they aren't tidally locked to anything. This particular asteroid, called Ida, looks like a standard 30 km wide asteroid as seen by the Galileo spacecraft, but you might notice this little blob here. This is actually Ida's moon, Dactyl. It's only 1.5 km across and orbits only 60 km away from Ida. We don't know especially how stable this orbit is, but a very cool thing to observe nonetheless. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and imagine a situation where an object that's very large and very destructive is about to hit Earth. Such as, for example, how many right here, or maybe some kind of a large asteroid that we've detected, I don't know, like a year or two prior to the collision. What are we going to do? What's, our, what's your first reaction? What is your first solution? And if you said nuke it, or use nuclear weapons, you would be surprised about this new research that says that's basically the worst thing you can do. As a matter of fact, turns out that nuking an asteroid will do nothing. Asteroids, as it turns out, are basically immune to nuclear weapons. And let me explain to you how this research was conducted and what they've discovered. Now, first of all, I think most people um, have seen Armageddon by now and the famous scene here, where essentially right before the asteroid strikes uh, the planet, they detonate the nuclear weapons and the entire asteroid explodes, separates into several parts and flies around the planet. Now, there's a lot of problems with that particular idea to begin with, but what I wanted to do specifically is show you how this particular simulation is basically completely wrong. This is not how nuclear explosions uh, happen inside rocks, and this is not what would happen to an asteroid either. And so, this is the paper that I'm going to be basing this on, and you can find it in the description below and read it for yourself. But essentially, what the scientists in this paper did was use uh, supercomputers to simulate what would happen to a typical rock with a known density and known size if you were to explode something on it, or better, even inside of it. And here is the kicker. Watch what happens if you were to explode a bomb inside an asteroid. And also watch the timer right here that shows you uh, hours 
after the actual explosion. So this is of course assuming that the nuclear bomb is somewhere um, either close to the surface or maybe in deep inside the asteroid. And as soon as this happens and the asteroid explodes, within about an hour, the actual core of the asteroid reforms. And this is really interesting because they've done this several times and they've discovered that the uh, asteroid will take less than three hours to reform most of the lost mass, essentially forming the core, only losing some of the mass to the explosion, which will eventually also come back and land on the surface. In other words, if I were to try to explode this object here, technically speaking, um, it wouldn't just suddenly fly apart into pieces. The actual core would eventually return back and um, reform and then strike Earth. Essentially, exploding an asteroid does absolutely nothing. Oh, and I just accidentally explode Earth as well. Well, that's something I do sometimes. But yeah, the idea here is absolutely brilliant, or at least the discovery is absolutely brilliant, because this really removes any kind of a scenario where nuclear weapons come into play. Now, there's still some chance that Russia might actually use nuclear weapons to detonate it on Apophis asteroid to test and see what happens. They were actually planning to launch this mission in uh, mid-2030s, and the idea here was to, uh, while the asteroid is really far from Earth, to possibly test a nuclear weapon on it. But as this particular simulation that I just showed you demonstrates, um, it seems that, well, if you explode something and it's really massive, the core will most likely return back, for reform, and still be quite hazardous. And scientists themselves actually mentioned that we used to think that larger objects would break more easily because, um, well, bigger objects like this one have more flaws in them. But what they've discovered is that it seems that the asteroids are a lot more resilient than we believed. And this also suggests that the energy required to actually explode this object would be tremendously larger than we assumed. So a simple nuclear weapon or even a hydrogen bomb would probably not be enough. You would need to place like hundreds of them inside of the asteroid for it to actually have a dramatic effect, for it to really sort of disappear completely and explode. A conventional bomb, however, will probably not really do this. It's not going to do um, explode an object and have parts fly apart. All of these parts will eventually come back and reform again. Now, honestly, that's a huge finding. That's a really big discovery. This really changes our approach to everything. We now need to start planning missions, which are actually already planned, uh, where we uh, analyze what happens to an asteroid if you nudge it. This is probably the best solution to a potential hazardous asteroid. We basically need to find out how much force we need to apply to a surface of an asteroid by colliding something with it really, really, really fast and possibly giving it a nudge on the side by basically bumping into it like this. And if you do this, it will get inertia and it will get momentum uh, to move in that direction and hopefully this will be enough for it to not collide with our planet. So right now, that's probably the only solution we have. There were a few other really creative solutions, like for example, um, placing a specific reflective material on the surface of the asteroid and having um, then sun do the work for us by creating an effect similar to a solar sail where the sun basically pushes onto the surface of an asteroid and then changes its trajectory. Now, all these ideas will have to be tested one day, but for now, Nuclear weapons and the whole premise of Armageddon, Deep Impact, and any other movie that used this idea are basically out. We just can't do it. It's not gonna work. Now, if you want to watch this simulation and also if you want to read the paper, all of this is in the description below. And um, I honestly think this is probably one of the coolest discoveries that were made using a supercomputer. And I guess the most surprising result here is how quickly the core reforms. It only takes like three hours. That's like nothing. And this makes you realize how we totally misunderstood how asteroids work to begin with. And uh, this research is actually done at John Hopkins University and they use their supercomputer that they have there. And uh, it's been doing some amazing job and creating some really, really crazy simulations that actually help us understand how things in space work to begin with. But I think in the last year or so, this has to be the coolest. And anyway, on that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Hopefully now you know why Armageddon and Deep Impact were kind of basically as science fiction-y as they get. 
even the actual idea of destroying an asteroid with a nuke would be pretty much impossible. And in this video we're going to be talking about one of the bigger mysteries of the 20th century, the Tunguska event. And in this video we're going to explore some of the recent discoveries, especially the ones from only a few weeks ago, with at least one recent discovery coming from a scientific team that may have actually finally solved what happened back in 1908. Now I wanted to start this video right here in Google Earth by trying to find where the Tunguska event happened. Now this was actually back in 1908 and until pretty much now we still kind of have no idea what really happened here. So the event happened somewhere in this area right here and I think it's actually in this boggy area that you see right here. And what's interesting about it is that even after basically over a hundred years since it happened, there are still quite clear indications of something major happening around this particular river that you see right here. I may have to cheat a little bit and look it up. And there we go, I was a little bit too far north. So this is essentially the Tunguska meteorite event, or technically just the Tunguska event, because we've never really recovered any meteorite from here, and this is why the mystery was created. For basically over a hundred years, the only real indication of anything actually happening here was the somewhat unusual clearing in the middle, along with a large number of trees toppled away from the center in a uh, relatively large area of about 50 by 50 kilometers or about 35 by 35 miles. And what's interesting is that even after about 110 years or 112 years now, you can still actually find some of the trees, especially the older trees, completely toppled down. So only the younger trees have been kind of regrowing in their stead. So we know that something major must have occurred here for all of this to actually look like this. But unfortunately, since the scientists didn't really get to this area until about 18 to 19 years after the event, and even then, except for a few photographs, they really didn't get to study the uh, area in a lot of detail, it's thus difficult for us to really determine what happened here, except for basically collecting some of these samples in the area and trying to use various modeling and computer simulations to try to estimate what may have caused all of this. So obviously there were a lot of different theories proposed, and some of these ideas were a little bit too extreme, like for example, some scientists suggested that maybe this was a a chunk of antimatter that exploded in the atmosphere. Some scientists even proposed an actual black hole, and this was an article posted in Nature magazine back in 1970. But the thing is, uh, we now know that pretty much none of this is probably true. Mostly because a lot of scientists in the past 20 years have been returning here, collecting a lot of samples, studying them in a lot of detail, and discovering some really interesting things. And as you can probably guess, nothing extraordinary or anomalous happened here. And so in this video I kind of wanted to cover some of the details we've discovered about this in the last 10 years or so, including the most recent analysis that used computer simulations to actually work out what very likely happened here. So first of all, the year is 1908. This area probably looked something like this, like you see in this aerial photo from only a few years ago, but then suddenly, in the early morning of June of 1908, there was a very unusual explosion that rocked the area that you see right here. This explosion was so powerful that its effects could actually be even felt all the way in Western Europe, and even these seismic detectors in the United States could actually feel the vibration created by this explosion. Now the only other similar explosion was obviously the Chilabinx meteor that happened in 2013, but this one was much smaller and on a much smaller scale, both in terms of the explosion and the effects it had. Here in this particular video you can actually see what this may have looked like, but obviously from a much smaller distance. So this explosion was extremely powerful, and it's very likely that the power itself was equivalent to about 3 to possibly even 30 megatons of power, equivalent to basically some of the bigger atomic bombs we've ever exploded here on the planet. The effects of this explosion were actually felt across a really large area, and even people hundreds of kilometers away from this explosion experienced basically shattered windows, and there were even reports from the local Evenki people that at least three hunters may have actually died as a result of being thrown against a tree, although these accounts were not really confirmed by anyone. But anyway, so the locals 
it was really cool painting I was able to find uh, right here, were very likely the only witnesses to this event in the vicinity, because these are the only people living in this area, and this is actually lucky because if this was a city, if this was a metropolitan area, the explosion would very likely destroy everything in the vicinity. And following the destruction even hundreds of kilometers away, Surprisingly, the skies around Europe were actually quite bright the following few nights. Now today we know that this was very likely because of all of the aerosols that were released during the explosion and were spread across the entire world, basically changing the color of the night skies for at least a few days, possibly even a few weeks. And even though back then the scientists obviously didn't really know why this is happening, today we know for a fact that this happened because of all of the ice particles that were deposited in the atmosphere, and this right here is a very similar fact. This is actually from a few decades ago from space shuttle launches that were actually investigated to cause very similar effects, glowing of the atmosphere due to all of the ice particles that were deposited by the space shuttle. This is actually known as a space shuttle glow. But now take this and multiply it by several thousand times to imagine what everyone around Earth probably saw back in 1908. There were also reports of various bluish lights across the night skies and of course really loud sounds and essentially an explosion. So all of these effects together today we know were probably caused by what's known as an air ball light, but more specifically something we refer to as an earth grazing asteroid or earth grazing meteorite. The most famous such event occurred back in 1860, here's a painting of someone actually witnessing it, and for the most part they all happen in a very similar fashion. Essentially it's a rock that ends up passing by really 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 closely to earth, essentially through the uh, lower atmosphere. It also often falls apart in the atmosphere creating a huge explosion, but then because its speed has not actually slowed down, it ends up leaving the planetary system and sort of returns back to where it came from. So these are earth grazing asteroids and they do happen quite frequently. Although more often than not we don't really get to witness them, mostly because they are either too small or uh, happen in areas where nobody is there to notice them. Now, for the most part, this is what we think happens. But why is it that we think so? Well, one of the main reasons is because we've never really recovered anything on the ground. There were no rocks, there were no actual pieces of a large pieces of asteroid, and for the most part, there were no actual craters. However, there was a suggestion that maybe the crater was actually this lake right here. There's a strange leak that some scientists suggested may be the sign of the rock that collided with the planet, but and up until now and also from all of the recent studies, we were able to establish that this is probably not the case. One of the biggest sort of signs against this being the meteorite location is that the trees in the area around the lake seem really, really old. If there was an actual collision here, those trees would probably disappear as well. And so the facts here were that, well, there was no actual crater, there were no pieces of asteroid being recovered, and there was no signs of any kind of actual physical explosion on the ground. There were only signs of fire, which was most likely caused by something exploding in the atmosphere, and obviously a lot of trees that were toppled down away from the center where this explosion occurred. So in other words, it was very likely some sort of an aerial explosion, which is also what some of the uh, witnesses in the area were kind of describing as well. But what else have we recovered in the last few years? Well, first of all, some of the recent discoveries were in regards to the materials recovered in the various bogs in this area. Basically, back in 2013, these scientists did actually discover tiny granules that very likely originated in space. These were filled with things like nickel, which is a very common uh, material that's produced in meteorites. And all of these samples that were recovered from these bogs definitely indicated that something must have come from outer space and exploded right above this area. So now the question was, what was it? Was it a meteorite, a comet, or something else? And to study all of this, the scientists had to actually come up with several different models and simulations to try to investigate what could have possibly created these effects. And so the most recent study that just came out a few months ago essentially argues that what was most likely responsible for the explosion was a relatively large, approximately 200 meters in diameter, a metallic asteroid very similar to some of the other metallic asteroids we've discovered on the planet. And their reasoning is pretty simple. In general, there are three types of body that usually collide with our planet. 
planet. There are either comets, which for the most part are made out of ice. A good example here would be Comet Halley that's predominantly made out of ice. And these objects, when they collide with planet Earth, they normally just kind of explode and evaporate completely. So if this type of a grazer passed through the upper atmosphere, it would very likely create a much larger explosion, and it would also most likely not even survive the passage through the atmosphere as described in the um, eyewitness accounts. So most of the theories agree that it was very likely not an ice type of an object, it was not a comet. It couldn't also be a rocky asteroid, simply because, once again, the density here would most likely create a much larger explosion and also would not actually leave the unusual trails that were observed by the eyewitnesses from a few hundred kilometers away. A typical rock, when it enters the atmosphere, doesn't actually have an ability to withstand the aerodynamic forces. It normally completely explodes in the upper atmosphere and sometimes reaches the lower atmosphere, but very rarely. So once again, this is probably not what happened here. A much more likely event was essentially an iron-based asteroid. These are very common on Earth as well, and we've found quite a lot of them. And it's not uncommon for iron asteroids to quite easily maintain their shape and essentially only evaporate when the temperature becomes really, really, really hot, which is exactly what they think happened. They believe that when it was passing through this area right here, which is basically the epicenter, the Tunguska asteroid itself most likely heated up to about 10,000 degrees Celsius and was creating this really, really large flame-like, or I guess you can call it sun-like object, that was so extremely hot that it set the entire forest underneath it on fire almost instantly. It only took like a second. This particular event was also elaborated by one of the eyewitnesses who mentioned that he was suddenly so extremely hot and felt so warm on the inside that he had to undress himself even though he was several hundred kilometers away from the actual epicenter of the explosion. And so what they're implying happened here was this really large plasma-like huge fireball that flew past this area right here really really fast at about 15 to maybe 20 or even higher kilometers per second eventually reaching speeds to leave planet earth but as it did so it was enough time for it to cause all of these effects we we're observing the explosion the fire and all of the other atmospheric effects were observed for a few days afterwards all of this kind of makes sense and the computer models created by these scientists do kind of collaborate the story which also of course implies that this rock is probably somewhere out there orbiting around the sun and could one day be actually discovered once again if we can somehow calculate its orbit and discover what happened to it after all. And considering the sheer number of air bolides that do happen on Earth pretty much every year, here's a map from about 20 years of investigation by NASA, it's of course no surprise that no rock was ever recovered. A lot of asteroids never really make it to the surface of the planet and many of them do end up just grazing in the atmosphere and disappearing into the outer space once again. But even though we might never discover what really happened here, the important part here is to understand that these events are pretty frequent. Current estimates suggest that such events usually happen every 200 or so years on the planet and smaller events happen even more frequently. So it would be really prudent for us to try to understand how these events happen and to try to predict them and possibly prevent them from happening. Because like I mentioned before, if something like this happened around a metropolitan area, the amount of energy produced by this explosion would basically be equivalent to a typical nuclear bomb. So this is definitely something we need to be aware of and study in a little bit more detail. But I guess for now, well, it looks like maybe we have kind of solved the mystery of Tunguska asteroid and we may have finally figured out why is it that we've never recovered anything major from this area. It's not the most exciting explanation, but honestly at this point it's better that we have closure rather than exciting explanation for an event that happened over 110 years ago. And I'm also certain that we'll have a lot more events to talk about in the future because these asteroids and these bolides are pretty common. Anyway, on that note, thank you for watching. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the Tunguska event. So there we are. It, uh, that, that, that sort of uh, is explaining why they've never found any pieces of the Tunguska meteorite in that... Uh, the object came in and uh, basically uh, went on its way without actually colliding, so it uh, could come back again to haunt us one day. <laughs> right, now I'll just finish now with um, the 3D uh, rendered view of the impact of Thea and the Earth. And uh, this was uh, going on for uh, 100 million uh, particles, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing.
uh, yeah, pretty pretty incredible when you think that of those hundred million, every time step that it takes, it works out the um, relationship of each one of those hundred million <laughs> particles with the other hundred million minus one particles, and has to work out the gravitational effect and uh, and uh, other effects, and then you increment to the next one. So that means that's um, that uh, ten thousand trillion calculations just for one time step. Uh, and uh, having to <laughs> have to do that over 24 hours. Anyway, thank you very much. Until uh, the November meeting, we'll uh, we'll see you.